Do you talk to your parents, your grandma, the same way you talk to your friend during a World Cup game? Do you talk to so on and so forth? Right. Know who you're talking to, tailor your language, tailor your tone, do your, and essentially it's the same with marketing, make sure the messaging, the communication you're using matches what your audience expects. Because if not, it's a really good way to break all rapport, break the trust and not set yourself apart from every other agent who's calling every other person they're talking to along the way. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Real Estate Nexus and Run360 podcast. My name is Jonathan Simonelli, and I am joined today by a couple of special guests who also share my name. I'm joined by John Didio, our senior ISA, and that is our inside sales associates here. And uh, he is one of our most seasoned veterans of the company who's been making cold calls, smart calls, and every form of phone calls for about the last 10 years. And he's going to share some of his experience with us. And we also are joined by one of our newer clients who goes by Jonathan Watts uh, from no Roanoke, Virginia. And what he's going to do is share some of his experiences over all of his time in real estate with us as well. So Jonathan, to get things started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're at and what you're all about, and then we'll jump into the topic for today. All right. I really appreciate it, John. Uh, I am from Roanoke, Virginia. I do own a team called the Elite Realty Group, powered by Keller Williams Realty Roanoke in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, I have a team of four agents currently, and uh, we pretty much will go anywhere in the state if we have to, uh, you know, within reason. So i uh, been with Ren for about a month now, extremely excited for what it's able to provide. Very cool. And as always, if you have any referrals, any questions, or any kind of information you need about the Virginia area, we can, with hands down, say that Jonathan is going to be the best resource for you there. Make sure you take advantage of his experience in the market, uh, both for referrals as well as information along the way. Um, there's no one better um, that we were able to identify along the way, and that's why we're working with him now. So jumping into the topic for today, we are going to be talking about objection handling um, and the mastery that goes along with it. Uh, essentially broken down into a bullet point, it is what to say and how to say it. And that's what we're going to be starting out with here, which is going to be on a high level, the difference and the explanation between what a soft objection is and what a hard objection is. There's a lot of room for interpretation along the way. So what we're going to do is lay out for you exactly what, from our experience, as well as Shanta's experience here, uh, what that consists of. Um, and so that way you have a clear understanding yourself. So John Didio, I'm going to ask with your experience on the phone here, what is, what is your definition or what is your experience working with hard versus soft objections? And how do you categorize them? How do you identify them as you're having a conversation with different people? Well, generally, from what I've experienced as far as soft objection, it typically isn't their the root, right? It's not their main objection. You will usually get them in the beginning and before you really get into a conversation, you introduce yourself, oh, I'm not interested, or I, I don't have time to talk, or give me a call back in, in a couple of months or something like that. It's typically just a blow off, right? We call them a knee jerk. Your hard objection will typically be your main objection. Yeah, you know, that, that sounds great, but honestly, we're really not interested in selling for at least probably six months down the road because we're retiring then, right? So that would be a legit objection. Or, you know, I had a really bad experience with an agent in the past, so I'm, I'm, if I do put it on the market, I'm probably going to sell it on my own. Right. So those would be legit hard objections. So the soft objection, if I'm hearing you right, John, would be simply pushing you off, saying any excuse to not actually open up the conversation. And then the hard objection is actually going to be what would be something outside of their control or something that has a hard deadline on it of what would need to be completed in advance of actually making a transaction or making a final decision on the property. Yeah. I mean, you can also get soft objections like when you close as well, which can also be an objection, but I typically think it's like a blow off, like, oh, I need to talk with my spouse before I do anything, right? Something like that <clears throat> to where it's not like a hard objection, but, you know, it's something that a lot of people still need to do before they move forward and do anything. 
Got it. And Jonathan Watts, what I'd be looking for from you on this one would be, obviously you have a team, you're part of a team and you're going to be someone that's making a lot of these calls yourself. How often do you run into these soft objections or these hard objections and what's your experience overcoming them? Or have you run into any roadblocks trying to overcome them along the way that we can talk about here? Uh, I definitely have come across a lot of objections. Um, I, I really feel like it's just trying to find the pain. Why were you initially trying to sell in the first place? Um, and just trying to relate to them in some way, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily coming off as a salesman, but just having a generalized empathetic, sympathetic conversation with why they feel the way they do right now to give me that objection. Um, as Didio was saying, that it, there's a root to the soft. And then when you're able to get to the hard, that's the pain. So once you're able to manage the pain, I touch on that pain a few times and tell them how I can take that pain away at really no extra cost than what they were doing before and possibly helping them, you know, achieve their goal and solve that pain faster and get them and where you, they So you close on their motivation as well, too. Correct. Got it. And I would Correct. say just for anyone who's not a seasoned prospector or is just starting to make these calls here, um, Jonathan Watts, how often when you're making these calls, how often if you're making a hundred phone calls, how many people would have that soft objection getting in the door along the way, if you had to pick a number? Oh, well, pretty much all of them, right? If, unless we're actually circle prospecting them and they've never been touched or they haven't been listed. Um, anybody that you're calling FISPO expired, et cetera, that, they had a motivation before. So there's, you're always going to get some type of soft. And then you find mm -hmm. out the heart. Oh, well, my agent didn't tell me. I, I didn't have any offers. Um, people would show up at my house and I had no idea they were here. Um, you know, those are getting closer to that initial pain of why they sold in the first place. The soft is, is great. If you can even give me the soft and just not hang up on me when I call and say not interested, um, I'll figure out a way. I will handle the objection with, listening to their tonality, um, which is a big thing that I teach my team. You really need to listen to the tonality and the voice. You can almost see somebody going with their hands crossed to their hands down if you mm -hmm. do it enough. So, but the hard ones are great. That's just, even if they, if I cannot get that appointment that day, I'm going to be writing down details of our conversation that I can touch base with in a, another phone call or an email or a text message. If you get the email, you got them. They're allowing you to contact them back via email. So um, that's kind of my experiences and how I teach my team, but you don't know unless you actually call and get to the salt. A yep. couple of key points I pulled out of there, um, John Watts, is just, I love the fact that it's, yeah, almost everybody's going to have a soft objection, if not everybody. And it's actually not a bad thing. It's a good thing. That's right. your, you're not getting hung up on. They're open-minded to the conversation because they're giving you something back when you're making that phone call, which means you have your foot in the door, at least, to be able to identify that true root, the hard objection along the way, which is then at the end of the day, as John Didio described, going to be what you use to actually solidify and tie down and get that appointment um, coming fully to fruition there. And so John Didio, I think the natural progression here is, okay, we're getting soft objections on literally every phone call we're making. What are, if you were going to pick the top three, what are the three most common and how do you overcome them? What's some language we can use to get over the top three most common soft objections? Uh, I, mean, I guess it really just depends on what type of lead, right? So like if I'm calling a Z buyer, a lot of the times uh, what I'll get is I don't remember doing that, Right. Or if I'm calling a, a for sale by owner, um, yeah, I, I'm not ready to list or, or I'm not, not a for sale by owner. I, I don't want to work with an agent. Or if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm calling like an expired, oh, I, I'm really not ready to sell right now. Right. So what kind of but, language do you use to overcome when someone's throwing those at you? I mean, I think really regardless of source, the root of it is I'm not really open to having a conversation with you now. What is the, what is the language you use to be able to actually get them to open up and how do you, what language yeah, do you Yeah, so use like T, for example, with the Z buyers. Oh, okay. Well, I was actually just doing my due diligence. I got a notification. I, I think it was earlier on in October, you had showed some interest in, you know, just kind of at least knowing what the property value was, or maybe it was just a cash off. Um, are you still the owner or is that property sold? 
right? So, so I want to go back questions. and take control of the conversation. Um, because if you don't have control of the conversation and lead where the conversation lead where you want it to go, you're not going to get anywhere anyways. Um, and if like, uh, somebody basically, you know, tells me, oh, no, I'm just not interested in selling maybe a year or two down the road or something like that, you still have an opportunity there. Oh, okay. So this isn't a forever home. Um, just out of curiosity, what's the reason that you're planning on doing a year or two down the road? Are you just, you know, considering, is it like retirement? Are you thinking about maybe trying to get closer to family, holding off on the market, right? So it leaves, it leaves an opportunity to ask more questions. And for anybody who listened to our previous podcast on here, actually the one that was just aired last week, that is what you're describing there, John, is actually what we considered or we identified as active listening. You're hearing what they're saying and you're re-engaging them back to the conversation along the yeah. way. And John Watts, what I'm going to be looking for from you on this one is John and I are both from New York. What we've been told is we're not the most pleasant people to talk on the phone with, especially if you're not from New York. Um, yeah. So we have a very, I'm not going to call it <laughs> unique, but we have a very specific strategy on how we approach and what kind of tone and what kind of, what way we address people over the phone. I'd love sure. to hear, because we found that Virginia is a little bit more universal in the way that you all communicate. What's some of the, like, you referenced earlier, the tone, the pitch, and how you're addressing or how what voice you're using coming into these calls. Could you elaborate a little bit more on what you've trained your team on or what strategies you've used, like what kind of voice and so on and so forth? It's very interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, we, we have a place down here called Smith Mountain Lake that we call Little Jersey, um, you know, because you have million dollar homes. That's nothing for, you know, the demographic up north to be able to come down and afford and purchase. So when we're calling these people, we know we need to be a little more assertive mm -hmm. and a little more to the point. Whereas in Virginia, you know, you, you have to play a little bit of soft with gathering the information, right? As Didio said, you know, you're, you're taking control of the conversation, but it's so that you can ask more questions to gather more information to better help these people in order to get the listing and get them where they need to be. So it's a certain amount of questions, listening to the tonality to not be intrusive to the mm -hmm. Southern, you know, we kind of keep to ourselves. We don't really get in anybody's business. You know, we, we, we're not going to give you so much information. We think you're a, a robocall or somebody's just trying to sell somebody, <laughs> you know, you, you have to be a little more coddling per se. It's, oh, well, you know, I was going to sell my house. My husband passed away. And uh, I had it on the market, um, but I was just so tired from the showings and I just think I'm going to hold on to it now, you know, and you're giving the, oh, I apologize. That's awful. Were you given any notice? Was, was anybody able to allow you an hour worth of time to prepare? Or did everybody just show up? So asking certain questions that aren't so intrusive and more about the situation to make it feel like you're caring yep. as to opposed to, well, I just need to know if you're going to list your house or not, you know, yep. I'm. I plan on spending maybe five, 10 minutes on this phone call and I got to get out of here. You know, yeah. there are agents around here that that have that kind of mentality and I'm the one who comes in behind them and takes it from them. So it's it's really about just gathering the information and a soft touch in a sense, but it leads you to that appointment because you're not so intrusive and you're not so pushy per se. You, you're really showing that you are worried about their pain and what they needed to sell it for in the first place. Yeah, so it's all about the discovery. Right, right. Very cool. And like what I that discovery, yeah. We always go back to discoveries, everything, because it's not an appointment. An appointment is when you go to sign paperwork. This is a discovery right. meeting to see exactly what we can do along the way. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go along here, John, but a couple of key takeaways that I um, got from what you were describing there, John Watts, was um, pretty much knowing your audience, knowing who you're talking to. The best example I've used in the past, I mean, keeping it at 300,000 feet here would be simply, do you talk to your parents, your grandma, the same way you talk to your friend during a World Cup game? Do you talk to so on and so forth? Right. Know who you're talking to, tailor your language, tailor your tone, do your, and essentially it's the same with marketing, make sure the messaging, the communication you're using matches what your audience expects. Because if not, it's a really good way to, break all rapport, break the trust and not set yourself apart from every other agent who's calling every other person they're talking to along the way. Yep. So right. to keep the ball rolling here um, and along the same vein, 
three steps to success with prospecting here. And I know we've been touching on these a little bit more along the way, but John Didio, I'd love to hear you explain essentially this three-step process for going into all of these different types of phone calls, regardless of lead source. And it's simply empath- empathizing, being empathetic, ignoring, which I know is kind of a dirty word sometimes, and then the tie down. And Didio, I'd love to hear a, a brief explanation on how you can follow these three steps going into the different types of calls and what each of them consist of along the way as a bit of a process that people could plug into and follow. Yeah, so when it comes to empathizing, obviously, we all know what that is, is we want to put ourselves in their situation, right? Their That's shoes, the soft touch. Right? So, yeah. but saying the word, I understand, or I get that. It, it's not enough. You know what I mean? It kind of sounds like, yeah, okay, but, right? So like if somebody gives us an ag- objection of, yeah, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I had a bad experience with an agent. I, I think I'm probably going to listen on my own. Um, I think a really good way to respond to that is I can't tell you how many people that I have talked to that told me the exact same thing. Um, But I can tell you right now, what actually separates us from a lot of the other individuals in the industry is such and such and such, right? So I'm acknowledging the objection, but I'm also relating to them as well with other people having that same opinion. So it's more powerful than just saying, yeah, I get that, but, or yeah, I respect your opinion, but. So you're taking that little extra time and you're just really, you're acknowledging and understanding and you're showing them that you understand versus just saying, yeah, I totally understand that. And just brushing right by it. You're giving them essentially the time of day um, to actually show them that they fully understand. Now, as far as ignore, I don't like to say ignore, right? Because you want to acknowledge. So what I like to do is sidestep it. Right. So if somebody gives me an objection, like in the beginning, oh, I'm not interested. Oh, okay. So before I go, before I let you go real quick, and then I'll ask a question. Right. Or oh, I'm not, I'm not looking to talk to any agents real quick. Yeah. I was actually just giving you a follow-up call, uh, but real quick before I let you go, blah, 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 blah. And then ask a question, right. It's what we call the Columbo effect. So you're not actually really ignoring or if like somebody says, hey, if you bring me a buyer, I'll pay three, 3%. You want to do the same thing, right? But you don't want to address that objection in the beginning because nine times out of 10, what? It's not going to be the true objection, right? So it's knowing where to spend your time on the call. And it's a good way to get roped into spending an hour, two hours. I mean, granted, you don't have the time of day to acknowledge everything. So being able to sidestep some of the soft objections, acknowledge Mm -hmm. to a degree, but not get tied up in them allows you to get down to that root, get down to that true heart objection and keep your way progressing through the phone call to, as John Watts described, a five to 10 minute versus a 30 to 40 to 50 minute phone call that at the end of the day, can still produce the same results of a discovery meeting, an appointment, an opportunity, et cetera. Yep. And and one of the most common objections that you are going to get is going to be about commissions. And that's the one that you're going to want to sidestep. You don't want to address anything when it comes to commissions whatsoever, right? That's, that's a conversation you want to have with somebody in person and you want to kind of tease that. um, And because if you tell them or you really get into that, you can, they got the information that they need. They, they don't know what you have to offer and how it can benefit you without actually meeting with you, right? So we want to build as much value in that meeting as possible, right? So it benefits them. If it, right. there's no ben, if it doesn't benefit them whatsoever, they're not going to want to meet with you. And then the, the last step, um, what was that tie down? Tie down. Okay. Um, when it comes to the tie down, what I like to do is like you were talking about, you know, John with your pain and motivation, right? So mm-hmm. I like to tie that up and wrap it up in a nice little bow, you know? So John, if there was a way that I could help you downsize, so you could get down to Florida and net the 250 that you're looking for, um, you know, in the next 30 to 90 days, I'm assuming you at least be open to having a conversation, right? Absolutely. Right. Right. So I tied your pain and motivation. 
into time frame as well, along with an assumptive close, right? I'm not going to ask you, you know, is it okay if I stop by or is it, is it, is it okay if we have a conversation about that? I'm not going to be timid about that. I'm going to say, you know, obvious, right? right. Of course, you're going to be open hand that conversation. Why wouldn't you? Right. Yes. Yeah, the confidence and the value that you're building, even in that, in that conversation. Yep. And then after you say that, I'm going to say, so let's do this. I'm in the area tomorrow. I'm meeting with a few other clients. I'll run some numbers. Uh, what's typically better for you? Would you say mornings or afternoons? So I'm telling them what's basically going to happen right. versus saying, hey, you know what? Um, I'm going to be in the area uh, tomorrow in the afternoon. Is it OK if I stop by like around two or or is, is four o'clock better? I will say four. Right? right. So there's a difference between asking, right? And assuming. Right. Always be so, assumptive. Yes. I know I kind of went off on a tangent there, but <clears throat> I think that really tied it together though. And yeah. John Watts, what I was really hoping to hear from you here is I know obviously you've been doing this for a long time. What are do you have a success story or a story in general? Because really the limitation that John Didio and myself have is we kind of get cut off once the appointment is set. We don't really move past it. That's when we hand it off to agents like yourself. Um, do you have a success story or any kind of story along the way of utilizing this type of strategy? And then what came out of it and or just what your experience using it was along the way? Absolutely. Am I, um I don't know if we want to specifically talk about a phone call, but I mean, I sent a handwritten letter to a for sale by owner, just had a small home. Um, it was overpriced. Just sent him a letter, said, hey, if you ever want to have a conversation, please feel free to reach out. Just a little passive thing that I could send out. Really wasn't expecting it. Called me, said, never had a handwritten letter before. Please stop by. Stop by, met him, built, built some value on it. Um, and it ended up being a commercial property that was trying to be sold as residential it was a very difficult situation. But um, with building the value and the fact that it showed up 15 minutes early to the appointment and kind of guided him through the process of it's not a hundred and not a hundred and fifty thousand dollar property. You know, it's it's 115 at best. And I, I would mm -hmm. feel comfortable at 105. And uh he 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 took the data, of course, that we all bring to everybody and gave it to him and he ended up going to 115 and my thing at that time was all right well it kind of reeled you in a little bit so we put into the contract at that time if you don't have an offer within a week we go to 105 where i'm at and then i'll i'll be able to sell it for you we did that but with the directing him and the transparency of you know this is how i'm going to help you you need to get to texas um sold that property I actually got a cash offer because it never would have appraised for 105 anyway and ended up giving me a six hundred thousand dollar home that was his personal residential property that we ended up selling as well. So it, it, it all, all started from a handwritten letter, right? <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. Um, which was, I don't really, I like to use earn your business. If I, if I even get to that point, instead of asking, you know, let me, what can I do to earn your business? Not necessarily, mm -hmm. Hey, would you be open to a conversation? Hey, would you be doing this? It was kind of giving them a little bit of power, but I'm the one directing it. Yep. You know, hey, let me let me have this opportunity to build a little bit of value for you to be able to earn your business. If you don't like what I have to say, you can kick me out of the door and I'll give you shoes to do it. And typically I get a little chuckle from that. Um, but I think the also I like that. The, the 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 consistency of things. Um as far as on a phone call, called an expired listing. He was not a happy camper. Um, I was probably the 87th agent who called him that morning. He was at the end of my list. And when he started talking badly about a particular agent, I started laughing because I thought it was comical. I thought it was funny. Some of the things that he was saying, it was just funny what he was saying about this agent. And he said, it's not been funny and hung up the phone. Well, no. I called him back. I said, hey, I'm sorry, Mr. John Doe. I, I, I'm in a horrible, horrible service area. I, I seem to have lost your car. I really apologize about that. And he went on to say, y'all are all just used car salesmen. You're so dumb. You can't even realize when someone hangs up on you. Click. So I called him back again. Sorry, said, we got I disconnected. Am, 
<laughs> I am really sorry, Mr. John Doe. I actually pulled over now on the side of the road. I really apologize if I dropped your call. I know this can be an annoyance. Um, I just have a couple of questions to ask you if you wouldn't mind. And he says, you are so persistent. And I said, absolutely. This is how I'm going to sell your house for you. I will be this persistent in order to get your home sold for his top dollar as fast as possible. So some of the persistence in the, you know, directing them to where you want to go, even if he's angry, that would be a hard objection is those hangups. But oh, definitely. He answered the phone. He knew it was my number. So that's what I'm thinking is we well, still answered the phone. Yep. There's still an inkling of something there. You're giving me an opening. So I know I just went off on a tangent, but that was just one of those that I tell my team, you know, they don't answer the phone, keep calling. If they if they give you a hard objection until they tell you to kick rocks, we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep a trying great story. to direct. I think a couple of key takeaways I got there, uh, John Watts, was simply, I mean, when he hung up on you the first time, if you would have called back, fired up, ready to go, rip roaring from New York like we are, he okay. probably would not have even let you get the first line out of your mouth before you hung up again. The mm-hmm. empathy that you had for him, hey, you know what? You probably had not happened the best day, and it probably comes through even without saying it in your voice. He at least answered the phone, as you said, calling back. And then mm-hmm. him hanging up on you, dropping one-liners, telling you to fly a cut and kick rocks and so on if you take those to heart and you don't sidestep you don't ignore as we were talking about those could weigh you down and you get hung up on a conversation trying to explain to them how realtors aren't used car salesmen and that's not the objection that's just a line he's used on the last 10 guys that got him off the phone faster right and then really at the end the tie down making sure that you can get him build enough value to where he actually is open-minded to a conversation and it's one of those things where if you go into these calls and you're not really sure what to do, you can fall down a rabbit hole. You can fall down a tangent. And what the biggest takeaway I've gotten from what John Didio, you're describing, John Watts, what you're describing, being able to position yourself to be in the driver's seat, to have control of that conversation, asking questions, asking the right or going about this the right way is going to be what sets you apart from the other people because this is going to be a stressful situation. It's the moving, selling, or buying a home is top three most stressful things you can go through in your entire life. The last thing that you need is to be responsible for the decision-making, including coming up with those phone calls, having someone be able to alleviate that from for you and or be able to take the wheel and say, this is the right way to do it. Might not be immediately what they think they want or what they need, but at the end, that's going to be what sets you apart from everyone else. And that's the earn your business mentality that I think the majority of clients look for and then come back to for that repeat and referral down the road oh yeah with that guy you definitely earned the business <laughs> yeah i did actually end up selling three of his properties but so that's was, awesome because a lot a good of I mean, other people just they don't have the guts to to do that you get hung up on once you know even a lot of people won't even call him back right but you call them right. back and then he hung up on you again most people wouldn't call back again they would be like all right you know? It's a no before you call. Yeah. You know, if you don't call, it's still a no. Right. So yep. what, what's what's the fear? You know, it's, exactly. It's, if you if you're using numerology and you're getting closer to it, it's just one step closer. Yep. I love it. And to take it to the next slide here, the last slide we have for today before we wrap things up. Effective prospecting questions, which is exactly what we're talking about here, making sure we are asking the right questions along the way. And John Watts, I might have you start this one out because it sounds like you had some pretty effective questions um, being asked with the first story you shared with us with a for sale by owner that I can say with confidence, the majority of agents I talk to, if they see a $100,000 property, they are uh, either not calling it and or passing it to the brand new agent in their brokerage that turned into a (laughs) $600,000 listing, which is probably the exact listing that 99.99% of agents I talk to on a daily basis would absolutely love to have. So I would love to hear some of the different questions or some of the different ways you were able to navigate that conversation to get from a commercial property that's being sold as a residential that turned into a residential that is in the price point that just about everybody right now is looking for. What are some of the questions? What are some of the approaches you used to get there? Because I think I, for one, am very curious to how you navigate that type of situation. Well, I mean, in, in that particular situation, I mean, to be all honest, it, it was not a great product. But it was it was more of 
creating the relationship and reading the environment that I was in. He used it as his business. He was a business owner. He was an entrepreneur. Well, for me, that's okay. He knows a lot of people. He's, he's, he's obviously very sharp. He knows what he's doing. He used it as a contracting business. So I initially thought, well, he could, he's either going to be building homes um, or he has a portfolio, something of that nature uh, made me sink my toes in. So initially with going in there and asking him was, why are you selling, finding the pain? Uh, you know, found out he was moving to Texas. This was his business. He'd already sold his actual business, um, but needed to just sell this particular property and was having a hard time. Been through two agents before he was a FISPO. And a lot of my questions after that were, well, what are some of the things that you enjoyed about your past agents? You know, instead of jumping right into getting the negative answers, I wanted to know what he enjoyed. Then we asked, okay, well, what are some things that you didn't like? Why, in your opinion, do you think your home didn't sell? And getting what where his mind was with his particular property to say, oh, well, yeah, they listed it at 165. That was just too much. Okay, well, did you guys ever have a conversation about maybe you needed to lower it? Did you have conversations at all? You know, just really, I really think a lot of the conversations you have to be on a top or a spinning wheel because you never know where it's going to go. It's it's more of adaption to the tonality or the answers that you're getting and you you have a generalized foundation, right, of knowing what you need to get. Um, and a lot of my big things that I give them is there's three reasons why a home will sit or sell. It's price, location, and marketing. And a lot of my stuff is, well, your price looks pretty fair. You know, that's that's good. Your location is wonderful. So you're probably just missing the exposure in the marketing. I'm sure your agent did everything that they possibly could. I just have different efforts. I'd love to sit down and show you what those efforts are. And then I continue to build value in person with those efforts by explaining what I do, how I do it, um, but by allowing them to ask questions. What do you want from me? What did you want from a perfect agent if everything went well? And I take those and I try to implement them into my conversation to say, yes, okay, well, you would love to be called Monday regardless whether you had showings or offers or anything to let you know any feedback or what we should do. Absolutely. I'll call you every Monday at 9 a.m. So... I could probably talk about what you asked me to as far as questions for another four or five hours, because I really feel like it's dependent on the situation, the client mm -hmm. and their pain and what they need. Well, here's so, what I took away from what you told us already here, John Watts, is you're walking through a minefield. And what right. this guy's doing Basically. for you is literally <laughs> drawing you a map <laughs> saying don't step here. Don't step here. Here's where it was really bad before. Here's where it's really good right now. And they're just painting you a picture of how to be the best possible agent for them to work with down the road where you're identifying all of these quote unquote objections, all of these problems, all of these pain points that without this type of questions you wouldn't normally have. And by the end, if you just write down every answer they're giving you, you'll have a list of what you should do, a list of what you shouldn't do, and a list of things to absolutely avoid at all costs. And if you just follow right. that, what reason would they ever have down the road not to work with you, not to come back to you and not to uh, pretty much give you more business in the future? Because A, you listened to them, B, you avoided all the things they didn't like, and C, you did everything they did like. You're checking all the boxes in a row right there, um, navigating that journey. I think the the question that really helps me make sure that I've gotten every objection is at the very end of the value and everything, and you get to almost that point where it's you feel like there's nothing left to say. It's my final question is always, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to list the property with me today? And if they don't say yes, then we get into why. And we start having that conversation again. Well, I just don't know. Okay, well, let me start over. My name's Jonathan Watts. I have a wife with two beautiful daughters. You know, it sounds like you, there's something that that's that's holding you up. And I'd really like to get to the bottom of it so that we can clear things up and you can have a more confident outlook on what I'm able to provide you as value and get you where you need to go. Um, it, it works very well for me to just, because if you, you're a lad, they're stuck and they don't, then there's no other reason why they shouldn't list with you that day. You're, mm -hmm. you're getting that every final objection out. Very powerful stuff right there. And I think that's exactly it is when they run out of objections, that's the time where they're ready to sit down and actually list the property to actually sign the contract to really do what they need to do to keep things moving forward. Didio, any kind of discovery questions that you'd want to throw in there? Any kind of discovery questions you've used, maybe two mm. to three of them that just really help you solidify a conversation or help you 
navigate through a conversation along the way from a specific lead source or anything along those lines? Uh, well, one thing that he really pointed out that I like to do a lot of people don't is, like you said, is ask what, you know, if they work with another agent in the past, what they felt like they did right, right? Um, we tend to focus on the negatives, um, but also finding out what they did right is huge as well, because now you're not just slamming an individual, you know, and coming off like everybody else. So you're separating yourself from a lot of other people out there, um, which I like. Um, and really, it's just about, you know, finding, uh, you know, what someone's past experience is you know, if they work with somebody in the past, you know, what type of feedback that they got, you know, um, things like, do you, do they feel like they did everything that they literally could have done to get that property sold? Right. Um, just things like that. I mean, John, you really took a lot of the questions that, you know, I usually ask, you know, especially when it comes to those, but it, it's all about discovery. It's based off the responses that they give you, um, knowing where to go, right? right. You, you adapt to the situation and that's how it is on every call. Um, that's why I always tell everybody there's no golden script. It's just, right. you know, a guideline that you have to have internalized. So you have a roadmap on where to go, you know, in the conversation, but every call is going to be different based on the responses that you get. And you might get stuff that you normally would get at a closing at the beginning. Right? right. And if you don't right. know how to adapt to that situation, um, you're, you're not, you're not going to know where to go. Right. Right. Agreed. Um, but um, no, I mean, it, it's more or less to just find about their, their past experience and how, you know, what we, what we have that could, that could help solve their issues, I guess. Yeah, right. de debating the different lead sources here. If you're asking a for sale by owner and expired what they didn't like about their previous agent, well, now you're going to be guilty by association because you're bringing back all those bad feelings towards real estate agents again, where if you ask, hey, what did you really like? And then you're really yeah. changing the entire tone of the conversation. So I think having a mix of both, definitely being able to identify the faults, but also identifying the really the wins and the successes along the way. Finding that right balance, depending on the lead, depending on the person is going to be what separates you and really just having that conversation, listening to the answers, acknowledging, ignoring the correct parts, and then tying them down at the right time is going to be what the uh, really deciding there is, factor is. There is one thing that I, I use on every call when it when with a for sale by owner is, um, you know, I say, Jonathan, I'm sure you'd agree that at this point, if your property got a little bit more exposure, not only you're going to be in a better position to entertain multiple offers and sell faster, but most likely you're going to net more, right? Hard yes. to say no to that. Yes. Well, what did I just get you to do? I got you to agree to that working with a realtor is going to basically benefit you in three different ways versus what's going on right now. Right. So if you give me an objection later on, you've already admitted to working with a realtor is be better than what you're doing right now. Right. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So that's one thing that I always um, use on every call. Perfect. When it comes to the yep. buy owners. Um, but I have to jump off. I have to do another training session in like uh, three minutes. John, yep. it was a pleasure. Um, Pleasure. Absolutely. So Manelli, thanks for having me on here again. Um, yeah. To wrap things up, Diddy, what we always like to do, the bottom line mm -hmm. in a single sentence, if someone's going to start prospecting immediately following this call today, any words of advice, anything that you would share with them or ask them to do, or what do you think the main takeaway is going to be for anybody that's uh, prospecting? First thing is, is have a script. Second thing is get it internalized. Okay. Mirror match the people that you talk to. And even if you're not confident, show confidence. Agreed, and close 100%. with confidence. Yes. Yes. They hear your tonality too. Yes. Absolutely. And then John Tone, Watts, pace, hesitation, how you modulate your words, but that's, that's a whole bunch of different things. So, <laughs> right, right. And then John Watts, anything you'd like to add? Any final thoughts? Any, um, Final words of advice for anyone who's going to pick up the phone for either the first time or the 300,000th time today 
any words of advice for anybody that's going to be following this podcast? Uh, yeah, for the people who do it the first time, it's going to be a no unless you pick up the phone anyway. So it, it's just like Didio said, internalize a foundational script. It will never be the same. And you just, you listen, you actively listen, take notes, and then touch on those details that you get throughout the conversation and direct them where you want them to go without being pushy. Just, you're going to get there. You just have to, you have to be smarter in a sense to direct them where you want them to go. And it's mm -hmm. all the mindset. And stay positive, no matter how many dials or how many no's that you get. Yes, because you got to sure. get 99 no's before your first yes. But that one yes, well, that's where the big paychecks come from. Absolutely. And, uh, what we've always said is don't ask somebody to marry you on your first date, especially not in the first 10 minutes. Take the time on the phone, get to know them a little bit, build that rapport before you pop the question, the listing question, the buyer question along the way. And uh, yeah, really with that, to wrap things up for today, if you guys liked what you heard here at Real Estate Nexus and Rent360, we are here to help you every step of the way. If you wanted to work more with John Didio, if you wanted to get access to anything that John Watts was talking about along the way, any of the technology that he's going to be taking advantage of um, following his time here with us today, renfreetrial.com. You can get started two weeks. Give us a try. See if you like it. Take advantage of all our training, scripting. If you don't know where to start, we can help you. If you've been doing it for 30 plus years and you're just looking to take advantage of the market today or need a little help navigating it, we are here to help any way that we can. Go on there, book a free strategy session. We would love to talk to all of you. John Watts, thank you so much for being on here today. John Didio, I know you got a training coming up in just a moment here, so we'll let you go. And uh, with that, we will talk to everybody uh, next week. John, I feel like you should be commentating on. I feel like you should be commentating on college football. Hey, I'm the John Madden of real estate. I'm told. So. <laughs> but perfect. All right, thanks so much, guys. Thank you.